I'm uh, transplanting some uh, licorice seedlings right now. This is the um, actual licorice that you uh, that you taste when you uh, have can like have the licorice candy and stuff. That's what this is. So uh, transplanting a bunch of these seedlings. It is uh, actually native. It's native to a zone seven, but with you know, with environmental manipulation, i.e., hoop houses and stuff. Uh, yeah, so it's actually the root that you use uh, in licorice, which is pretty neat. Uh, but yep, it's a. Uh, oh gosh, I'm probably gonna slaughter it. Glyso, Glyceriza, Glabra. Yeah, I don't know. Best of luck. Many of my Latin people out there can read that it's kind of blurry i want to focus there it is but yeah so this is uh you know one of the really crappy things is that you know the fires are still going on in canada but this is actually a uh, plant that benefits that its seedlings benefit from extreme heat um so like in order to really get a good germination on these you actually have to soak the seeds and shock them in water that is over 160 degrees um, and just that that massive burst in temperature uh, triggers them to start start growing so it's kind of a kind of a neat plant to mess with uh, this will be the first time growing it out but the root systems are pretty vigorous so I'm sure before the end of the season I'll have to pot it up into gallon pots just kind of like the waiting room now like it usually is we got about another six minutes or so and then we'll get started All right, sounds good. And I, um, the settings on Facebook allow me to where I can actually save them on my page for as long as I want. So Franny asks, um, are plants that attract moss different than ones that attract butterflies? Uh, that's actually a really good question. Uh, yeah, so tonight, so tonight's uh, topic, uh, we're going to be talking about uh, gardening for moss. And uh, the one really cool thing about gardening for moss uh, is if you're gardening for moss, you're gardening for butterflies. So there are a lot of correlations between the two, uh, but there are some differences. And, 
we'll kind of get into that tonight. Um, but yeah, that, no, that's a fantastic, fantastic question, and uh, we're definitely going to be chatting about that for sure. Well, I got that stuff transplanted pretty quickly. Uh, right now, so right now, oh, I just finished. Uh, I'm uh, transplanting licorice. Uh, started a bunch of licorice from seeds. Uh, licorice is actually one of those plants that benefits from uh, extreme temperatures, i.e. fires. You know, there's, there's a lot of pine tree species as well. Uh, and one of the uh, one of the cool things about them is you get better germination rates when you um, actually start when you drop them in water. You start them off in a boiling water, so well, not really boiling, but like 160 degrees or, or hotter. If you do too hot, you'll end up cooking them. But 160 to 180, somewhere in that range. Um, but I've got those growing out. They're actually a uh, they're actually a native North American plant. Uh, this is the edible licorice, so it's the one that you taste in a lot of your uh, like different candies and things of that nature, and it's the root that's edible. So I'm, that's what I was just uh, transplanting there, and now I have a bunch of uh, rose mallow, which is the, it. it's more, it's, Everyone calls it a hibiscus. Uh, there are cultivars of it, like you see like the dinner plate varieties. That is technically considered a mallow and not a hibiscus, but um, just like everything, the name is what usually sells it, so that's why they use the, uh, the word hibiscus or instead of mallow. Uh, but I've got a bunch of that and uh, some tall thistle I'm gonna try to get done tonight because these are all going to primarily be grow outs for next year, but if I don't get them in now, then I mean, as you can see, they're already starting to starting to re, uh, get a little root bound, and you don't want to stunt their growth, especially when they're small. So that's what I'm working on tonight while we talk. And seven o'clock. Look at that. Welcome everyone. This is. The third, yeah, the third uh, Terror Talk, and tonight I figured since we'll do, we're gonna do a little follow up. Last week was National Pollinator Week, and we talked about um, you know pollinators and bringing more pollinators into the garden. But this week I really wanted to uh, focus on one pollinator in um, in specific uh, specifically, and that is the moth. You know, the moth is one of those pollinators that no one really ever thinks about. You know, that's what, they're like, oh, the moth's all around my light when I'm coming in from, oh, you guys can hear the tree frogs. They're actually, uh, side note, by the way, uh, they're actually spawning in the, uh, the fish tank for our living wall, and there's a ton of eggs in there. Uh, uh, but yeah, I don't know if you guys can hear it. Uh, Cindy asks, I had a Luna moth in my garden the other day what do they eat that I can plant for them they are beautiful so um, one really one really uh, cool thing and I'll touch base on it a little bit later but um, one of the biggest differences between butterflies and moss is well besides moss being primarily nocturnal there are a few diurnal species um, but um, Moths do not have any functioning uh, mouth parts or a uh, digestive system. So if we're planting for moths, what we want to do is we want to plant for that larval species. And the uh, some of your more popular ones like Luna moths, uh, uh, Coleoptera, uh, those are like the really big like buckeyes and things of that nature. Um, they're attracted to Primarily nut and uh, fruit trees. So if you're up, um, I would say up around your area. Video keeps flashing by. It could be because there's too many leaves on the tree. 
and uh, the reception is absolutely terrible. Has it cleared up at all? It might be the service down here, I'm not sure. Um, but uh, to attract Luna moss, you're gonna wanna plant the, uh, the plants in which their caterpillars are, uh, are going to want, their caterpillars or larvae are going to want to uh, eat. Uh, and in Luna moss cases, you're looking for nuts and fruit bearing trees. Uh, so you can grow persimmons, uh, black cherries, um, things of that nature. Uh, raspberries is another one. They're not really as keen to raspberries, but it does, uh, they will take to them. Um, but uh, chestnuts, so if you're trying to kind of like revitalize and bring chestnuts kind of back to your area, it, do it plays a dual purpose. You're not only, you know, growing chestnuts and trying to bring them back to your area and maybe have chestnuts later on to eat. Um, but you're also planting a tree that is going to be beneficial for luna moth caterpillars. Uh, black walnuts are another really big one. Um, with the area where you live, um, what is attracting them is that big willow in the side yard. Uh, willow is one of those that is like super popular with a multitude of not only butterfly um, species but also moth species. Um, so, you know, black willow, white willow, um, pussy willows, uh, those are typically like your really common ones that you're going to see. Um, but they will, they will actually eat, um, like weeping willows as well. Uh, so you're probably getting them from those. If you, if you want to plant other trees, again, you can kind of produce, uh, trees, which are beneficial for you too. Persimmons, that's, that's one, which would be another great option. You can grow persimmons, eat them, but at the same time, you provide food for the uh, butterflies. Uh, but yeah, we'll, uh, I'm going to kind of, uh, I'll kind of start. It's not really like a presentation. If it gets too dry, uh, just let me know. Um, but humans have been kind of working with, uh, you're welcome. Humans have been kind of working with moss for a really 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 long time uh, I so I'm sure some of you are already thinking about it um, but since about 2600 BC uh, humans first discovered that hey this moth moth caterpillar spins this little soft white cocoon and if we get this cocoon wet um, it will actually produce a strand of silk. And so that's where all of this started. Uh, I have a little note here if I can find it. So it's, I, was up, I thought this was kind of neat. Uh, is that the, the legend of the silkworm uh, came about when the empress of China at the time was sitting underneath a mulberry tree, which is the silkworm's favorite um, and only host tree, and a cocoon fell into the cup of tea that she was uh, drinking. And as she tried to pull the cocoon out of the uh, out of the hot tea, um, the silk started getting stuck on her strands, and she realized that hey, this material is really soft and it's also strong, you know, it would be fantastic to use this. So that's where the, kind of like the legend comes from. It does originate over in um, in China, obviously the, the, the Silk Road and all the major silk trades came out of that, uh, that Far East Asia area. Uh, but it's, it was about uh, 26, 2600 BC when they first started using silkworms and today uh, as of 2021, um, in just the year 2021, there were 700,000 tons of silk produced from this tiny little uh, silkworm. So mulberry groves are a massive industry. Humans are working with moths all the time. 
they just don't realize it. Um, you know, one of you might be wearing silk right now. You are wearing a product of a moth. It's just the larval form of a moth. And um, the astronomical number of 700,000 tons is mind-blowing because one cocoon of a caterpillar may produce like a 20 to 36 inch strand of silk and that's you know if pull out of your scarf a 20 inch strand of silk and go okay well there's 700,000 tons of this that's produced every year from these moth species uh, so it's it's quite quite astronomical uh, but here in North America uh, there's about 11 thousand species of moths most of them you would just look at and you just be like that's a moth there's a lot of different types of fungus moths uh, you know obviously tree tree host species moths um, you know then there's there's also actual moths that live in the mud uh, but what's what's really sad about all of this uh, is that since the 1950s, there's been about an 85% population decline in moth species. Um, and just off of that 85% population, or rough estimation of 85% population decline, uh, 10 species are known to have gone extinct. You know, that, uh, those numbers may be more. Uh, they're definitely not less because that is known since 1950s. Um, a lot of this has to do with uh, chemical pesticides, uh, spraying them on trees, spraying them on your yards, um, spraying them on ornamentals that do have that same kind of uh, favorability for those moth species. And uh, the, uh, the other one that is now starting to play an absolute massive role in the decline of moths was the uh, introduction of the uh, tetanid uh, fly. It's a, it's a really, really tiny fly uh, that they introduced to help combat the uh, gypsy moth caterpillar. Well, it's doing a fantastic job at that, but it's also doing a fantastic job at killing about 200 other species of moth caterpillars a year so while it's working very hard to eradicate the gypsy moth caterpillar we've now introduced this uh, predatory species into the environment which is now actually destroying um, a lot of the other uh, moth species so it's it's kind of a tough one uh, you know but there are things that we can do uh, I did uh, Oh, where am I? There I am. Uh, I did kind of mention roughly about uh, the Luna moths and how to attract those. Uh, I'll get into a little bit more uh, detail later. But out of out of moth species, you typically you have like three categories. You know, with butterflies, you have one category. They're diurnal. Uh, with moths, you have diurnal, nocturnal and I have this word written down because I usually always slaughter it, is uh, crepuscular, crepuscular. Uh, it means they're only active at dawn or dusk. Um, so I'm probably slaughtering that word, but it is what it is. Um, we know a lot about diurnal moths because we are awake during those times. It's easier to study. Uh, and it's just, you know, a little bit better of a way to study. You, you don't have to have all this fancy equipment. You literally just go out with your eyeballs and just watch flowers. Uh, one common moth species that you may see uh, throughout your day, um, especially on like Monarda or the bee bomb, is uh, the sphinx moth. It kind of looks like, they call it the hummingbird moth as well. Um, it's, it's a very fast flying moth. Uh, sometimes if you have like garden structures during uh, this time of year and going into uh, early fall, that's when you're really gonna see them. And it's, it's pretty, um, pretty neat to watch them. They do look just like hummingbirds, but um, they'll actually, just like with hummingbirds, have a ton of pollen around, their, around their, the front of their face and they're quite a large pollinator. Uh, but 
on the other hand, you have their uh, their crepuscular and nocturnal species, uh, and there's not a whole lot that's known about these species and like what their preferred plants are when it comes to pollination factors. Like we know with the moss species that don't pollinate, such as Luna moss, uh, Coleopteras, uh, that because of their larval activity they're able to eat uh, these specific trees but once they become adults they obviously don't feed but there's um, a whole wide range of nocturnal pollinating moths which are hardly ever studied um, you know there there's a few myths that as it goes on how to attract these moths you know there's uh, the myth, well, I shouldn't really say myth, um, but some of the more like common sense um, ways to attract these types of moths are white flowers uh, and also obviously evening blooming flowers. The problem is, we don't really have a lot of uh, white evening blooming flowers. There are a few native species that I'll get into later. Um, but one of the main common ones that everyone thinks of right off the bat is moonflower. You know, it's in the morning glory family. The, it gets massive white uh, flowers to it. It opens up towards the evening and it stays, stays blooming all night. Uh, and it'll close up during the day. Uh, that is one plant that does attract uh, moss. Uh, a few of the uh, other plants that attract moss um, you know for tree species the what like I said willow is a uh, pretty sure win when it comes to uh, attracting a multitude of different uh, moss species oak is another one it's a very another very popular um, tree species amongst moths and caterpillars um, then you have uh, like your nut producing trees like hickory beech walnut uh, your fruit producing trees such as like cherry uh, that's that's a really good one the black cherry is a fantastic uh, fantastic attractor not only of uh, butterflies moths but during the during the fall you can get like different a ton of different types of birds that will come in and actually feed on the black cherries so it's a that's a nice um, beneficial tree to have in a yard especially if you're trying to attract um, moth species um, some of you like your smaller like shrub types uh, a native honey a native bush honeysuckle is um, a fantastic fantastic uh, whoo thank you for the 50 stars much appreciated um, native honeysuckle is a uh, bush or excuse me uh, native bush honeysuckle is a great shrub variety uh, verbenum is you know, you see a lot of that in uh, Lowe's and Home Depot and some of those other big box stores. But uh, the regular uh, non-cultivar varieties are actually beautiful. They've got nice white flowers, which do stay open later into the evening. So they could benefit nocturnal species of moss while also benefiting diurnal moss and other pollinators. Roses are another one. Um, if you have roses, you know, a lot of people that keep roses, unfortunately, uh, they spray them with all sorts of stuff. Uh, you know, obviously, roses struggle with fungus, so you, you gotta give them some fungicide. You wanna keep the Japanese beetles off them because this is the time of year right now where we're starting to see the Japanese beetles. Not really a whole lot with uh, the June beetles, but. Uh, I saw a couple of them the other night. They were just kind of flying around, acting as June beetles do. But I've been seeing, just starting now, to see uh, more activity from June beetles and um, uh, Japanese beetles. And before I forget, um, when you see the activity of June beetles, you typically see an increase in activity in uh, moth species. Uh, a lot of uh, moth species, their cocoons are temperature sensitive. So 
you know, for a lot of those species, like you start hitting those like 65, though that like mid 60, 65 degree going into 70 degree nights, that's when you start seeing a larger activity into moths. Usually like when we go into July, it's like full blown moth, speed, moth, uh, moth time. And you know, one way to check to see what kind of moths you have is just leave a light on overnight. But other, other plants uh, to attract moss, um, you can use flowering tobacco. There are native species of tobacco that are um, local to uh, North America that you can use. Uh, tobacco is also one that you can eat, uh, or not you can eat, but uh, different pollinators will actually eat. Um, there's a uh, uh, blue stem grass, which is a native prairie grass. It's a large host to a multitude of uh, pollinator species, moths, uh, and butterflies. Not to mention that uh, solitary bee species, such as like your little green emerald bees, uh, will actually use the inner interior of the uh, grass stems during the fall and winter to actually overwinter. Uh, and of course, one of the other ones was Monarda or Bee Balm. Uh, that one's like super popular across a lot of different species. Uh, so that's that's a few of the key ones that you're, you, you're gonna wanna try to uh, do um, as time goes on. Um, so I hope I've kind of uh, answered, I hope I've kind of, you know, gave a little bit of this. I'm not trying to, uh, I'm trying to do something a little bit different tonight uh, with uh, if you were working Franny asks if you were working with a small space one raised bed what are some good plants to have variety and make some pollinators happy so if you were working with just say a single raised bed uh, let me say four by four you know that's it may be smaller it may be bigger but out of four by four you can kind of divide the ratios up just a little bit to kind of um, you know get into something else um, in a four by four space you could technically grow and you're gonna want to kind of figure out what your other area is around you could grow some type of shrub so a verbenum would be phenomenal for it um, and as that verbenum grows, you can grow other plants around the lower part of it. Uh, but if you're like, yeah, you know, I don't really want to go like one single plant and then half the way. I want to plant a couple different species uh, within the garden. And I want to benefit, you know, as many pollinators as physically possible. Uh, but I'm focusing in on, you know, moths. Uh, what I would do is say, okay, well, you're going to want... Uh, milkweed obviously for um, your you're going to want milkweed obviously for your monarchs uh, on the back if you're able to put a trellis up you would grow passion flower for your tiger swallowtails um, both of those will produce a nectar source um, tiger swallowtails will use the passion flower as a host um, you could add uh, evening primrose which doesn't get very tall it does bloom in the evening time and stays open uh, into uh, the later hours of actual nighttime uh, for your pollinator uh, moth species. And then I would say off to the back corner, I would probably put in uh, some bee balm. Uh, I would say like as you look more into pollinators, bee balm is going to be one that is like very reoccurring because it is very it's, it's, it's a versatile um, it's a versatile species that has a lot of uses not only for us but also for our pollinators uh, so it's it's definitely going to be one of those that you know you're going to want in your garden thankfully there's I think like seven or eight native species of Monarda in the United States so you know you can you can have a variety of different purples and uh, lavenders. There's there's a bright red variety that 
we actually have blooming in our garden right now that's like super vibrant but it's a natural color um you know and that's 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 going to be key is you know not only color uh but also things that smell because if the flower is not white one of the ways that you're going to want to attract nocturnal moths is by scent and if your flowers have a lot of that really sweet scent um then that's definitely one way to attract them is by that scent uh, so that's those are just a few it's a four by four garden if you have a smaller space you could probably do two of those and that would be like a max um, you're gonna want to be careful with your bee balm because it is rather aggressive in a uh, I would say cultivated garden you're going to want to be very careful with it uh, same thing with like a couple different grass species that you know we try to suggest to people uh, this grass species is like super like a prairie broom for example uh, prairie broom is a phenomenal grass species it's a host to a ton of different pollinators uh, as it seeds out in the in the fall it's it's a waypoint for different types of birds primarily finches to stop and actually eat the seeds as they go through um, but it spreads rhizomatocy and it also self seeds so it is going to be um, it is a very 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 uh, aggressive plant in a cultivated setting so if you have more of a naturalistic setting that you're um, place that you're trying to go for then by all means do like a bee balm and like an evening primrose and those two right there would do phenomenally together um, and you hit both like you know late spring flowering going into summer to like early summer flowering late spring flowering going into um, fall flowering so there's a there's a wide range of uh, uh, there's a wide range of like options there when it comes to pollinators was there another question asked from somewhere I'm trying to see here hmm let's see it all right uh, so moonflower can be good uh, I would say in your grow zone it's good because it's an annual uh, it'll be an annual through and through um, it produce it'll it'll it produces nectar it attracts them it's bright it's white and it it it's it stands out for moss for nectar um, oh I'm sorry uh, Cindy had asked um, is moonflower a good one for moss and uh, uh, the short answer is yes um, the long answer kinda moonflower like I said annual um, but all you're, all you're doing is attracting the moss you know just like with the what we were talking about last week where you have pollinators like yay there's a million pollinators on all these flowers but what now you know there's the one fascinating thing about moss is like if you see that moth in your garden that moth was probably pupated and stayed in that garden and it hasn't gone anywhere else these aren't migratory animals like if you see a luna moth in your area an adult luna moth is usually only alive for three days and its only goal in that entire uh, three days is to find a mate and lay up to 200 eggs and it only has a very specific amount of time and there is an absolute pile of nighttime predators that want to eat that moth so yes it's a it's a really good pollinator but you know what 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 else is there after that and that's what everyone should be asking is you want to continue to like bring them into your yard and that's 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 fantastic but 
what can you do to keep them in your yard? You know, there's, and that's the, that's, that's the big draw here. So, you know, especially for, um, for your area, um, as for like nocturnal, uh, moss, I'm sure there are nocturnal moss, um, and moonflower would not hurt. Franny asked, what are some options for plants that pollinators moss like, but, uh, but also might be food or herbs for us? So, um, like I was talking about earlier, uh, one that I mentioned uh, was uh, uh, tobacco, flowering tobacco. That's one that both um, we and the moss can use. It's beneficial in both of those aspects. Um, Another one is evening primrose. Granted, some of these are a little more advanced for uh, for like uses. So please, you you need to uh, do your do your research before uh, you just willy nilly try any of this stuff. Um, there's there's another uh, there's a couple other ones. Uh, you know when it when it comes to. Uh, the food species stinging nettle is a really good one. Uh, stinging nettle is used in teas. You can actually eat the fresh leaves uh, when they're young, or you can boil them off and eat the leaves then. So stinging nettle is a great food source for the lar uh, for the caterpillars or caterpillars of moth species, uh, but also uh, something that you can use. Um, again, all of these uh, fruit bearing and nut bearing trees. Uh, you know, if you go out and you plant, you know, a half a grove of chestnuts or a full grove of chestnuts, you're not only creating a massively abundant food source for a moss population, but you're creating a food source for uh, you and your family. You know, you're creating um, a long term, a long term, uh, you know, product that you can count on for decades to come uh, not to mention you know your your hazelnut trees and your hickory trees um, your beech trees uh, your walnut trees uh, a lot of these trees that you know you're that you can actually get something out of are also very beneficial for um, for moths um, as for other herbs uh, uh, hazels, uh, currants. So both of those are not really they're they're herbs in a sense. Like if you're using them in specific ways, uh, but again, this is all stuff that you need to uh, kind of do more research into. Uh, so there there are, a, and I'm sure there's others. Uh, the the Rolodex isn't flipping as fast today. Um, but that's just a few of them that I can name off the top of my head. Uh, I mean, shoot, when it comes to the amount of, and th this is one of the hardest things, is um, fruit bearing trees, like apples and plums. Like apples, and, apple and plum trees are like, I mean, those are two apples, especially is one of the most widely cultivated fruit trees um, in the United States, if not the world. Um, and there is an absolute ton of moth species that use the apple tree as a host. But the biggest problem is it is a commercial slash industrialized farming product. These people aren't like, oh, there's a few holes in, the, in my apple leaves. You know, it must be this one specific moth that, you know, is just going to eat a few leaves and then pupate into the ground. And, no, we're going to uh, spray the ever crap out of everything with pyrethrin and some of these other more like nuclear uh, types of uh, chemical pesticides. And, you know, you have hundreds and thousands of acres of food availability, but it's not actually edible. So there's there's a... There's some big problems, uh, especially culturally, uh, that definitely do need to get looked at uh, long term, you know, but there's, it's, it's slowly getting there, you know, I see, a, I see kind of a, 
a bigger push towards more uh <laughs> yeah the frogs do be screaming um uh, hey, hey will it's no worries brother uh the nice thing about them is even though i film them live they're up on the facebook so you're always you can always go back and check out any of the other videos if you're ever interested are there any moths that are bad for the garden uh plants environment like the ones that eat wool clothing uh, so yeah of course you know there's uh, well okay let me let me say this uh, the it's I'm trying to I'm trying to figure out a uh, for you and I it's bad but for the moth it goes oh well crap you just put this huge food source in front of me well yeah I'm gonna take advantage of it um, you know, if I, the ones that are in wool and get, they get into other clothing, I, what are those, clo closet moths or something like that? I'm not 100% sure on the species of them. Um, but yeah, I mean, when it comes, when it comes to moth species, um, outdoors, you know, the, um, you're definitely going to see, um, different species, uh, attack you know vegetables that's a that's a big one um what is it the hornworm that's one of the most common ones in the, that you'll see you know you can go out there that horn and you can go out there you'll have a whole nice big bushy tomato plant and then all of a sudden you look in the evening and it's stripped right bare leaves but you got a worm you got a hornworm on it this big you know, I'm torn between those because I love seeing sphinx moths, but at the same time, I'm trying to grow this produce uh, and, you know, consume this for my family. So there's, um, you know, it kind of goes back into that conundrum that we were talking about before with the apples where, you know, there has to be this balance between, yes, I want this species to, you know, not be you know air quotes bad you know but it's just, it's just them doing what they're doing there's a food source available and that's what they're going to um, you know take upon themselves to do uh, is eat that food source uh, while also having us going hey you know like this was my food source so there's there's that balance of you know maybe if you do notice you get a lot of hornworms that's actually kind of good because that means you have a lot of flowers that uh, sphinx moths like uh, but you know maybe growing a couple extra ones um, and yeah another another one is the uh, is the cabbage ones um, if I'm not mistaken uh, the cabbage ones are uh, butterflies um, because they produce a small little kind of fuzzy green uh, caterpillar. Uh, but again, it, it, you know, try to grow maybe like a pot or something just for those or something. Try to, there's, there's always ways to try to work with that stuff. Um, you know, like, like last year we had uh, a ton of different species, um, but with swallowtails. Uh, I'm back. I'm back. All right, I'm back. I think I'm back. Woo! All right, that was weird. I just just completely dropped internet. Sorry about that. It was weird. Um, but yeah, if you if uh, just try to find a way to work with them. You know, obviously you can't have a moth eating your wool clothes. You know, and it's not like you can be like, well. Here's a pair of wool pants you can eat, moth. So sometimes you do kind of have to control where they go, and you know it's 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 a careful balance at the end of the day. So all we can do is our best, and that's really it. Uh, some of the some of the like key tips I can give you on making your yard or your garden more moth friendly 
Um, number one, um, don't be so tidy. You know, just like with what we talked about with our solitary bees um, last week. Um, don't pick up all those dead sticks. Don't pick up all those, like, dying stalks of plants uh, in the fall. You know, you have a few leaves that are piled up in the garden. So be it. That's fine. Leave them until the weather warms up. You know, the the nice thing about dead, dead um, organic material is that it decays. You know, all you're doing is you're just leaving material decaying in your garden or on your lawn, um, which will actually just help benefit it. Um, but don't don't clean everything up. You know, the, the moth species, uh, you know, that's where their caterpillars go down to create their chrysalises um, and their cocoons. So uh, let it go a little more natural. Diversify your plant selection. Mother Nature does not like monocultures. Um, and that's very evident by all the pesticides and all these different uh, integrated pest management, um, you know, courses that people are selling. And, um, you know, it, you just want to be... Oh, in the photo? Okay, yeah, you did send me something. Um, let me see real quick. I don't, I don't know if I can share it or not. Yeah, I'm not sure if I can share it. Honestly, I'm not. I'm not 100% sure on the uh, on the moss species. Uh, I would say that that is from uh, a woolly bear. Um, yeah, I'm not. I'm not sure if you can send. Uh, I'm not sure if you can send photos uh, through through the chats here, but I would. I would say that's from a woolly bear. Um, and in all honesty, it's it's like. I think it's called like the the lesser fuzz moth or something something silly like that. Um, it if you look at it, you'd never know. It's just this very like plain kind of I say plain. It's just this very like brown moth that like nine times out of ten if you passed it in the wild you'd probably never see it. But you you always see their little caterpillar their the woolly bears crawling around all over the place. Uh, but that that's most likely what that is uh, and that's just kind of judging off of at the base there where the abdomen part is uh, it kind of has like some orange segmentations in the uh, the chrysalis uh, but where was I uh, diver so diversify your plant selection uh, you know, Mother Nature does not like monocultures. Uh, she will throw pests at you. She will do everything she can um, to destroy that one crop that you're growing. So plant more. You know, what gardener does not like a million different varieties of flowers and grasses and shrubs and trees to surround them? And that is what moths like. You know, cat uh, butterflies, they're pretty simple. You know, they're pretty, but they're pretty simple. Um, give some milkweed to the monarch cool the monarch will come you know throw some carrots in a in a in a bed uh for the tiger swallowtails and they'll come to it you know it's not a big thing but with moss because they need they need a hiding place for the day they need a place for their um you know they need a place for their larvae to go and process throughout this entire year and that's not like caterpillars where a lot of butterfly species will form a chrysalis and they'll come out of the chrysalis before they, um, you know, before winter comes. There's a lot of moth species that, oh, winter's coming, they crawl down in the, crawl down in the dirt and in the leaves and then they pop out in the spring. You know, there's some um, butterfly species like that, but a lot of them that you see, um, you know, do have migratory patterns. Um, 
So diversify your plant selection. Get a selection of day blooming and night blooming species, you know, and spread them around your yard. Don't just be so centralized with everything because that's where a lot of your predators are going to focus. You know, the, with all of these species that we talk about, um, you know, they all have predators, especially your nighttime, uh, your nighttime uh, moths. You know, those that Luna moth, that big Cleoptera, that's a big moth. Owls eat them, foxes eat them. Um, you know, down south more, different lizards and snakes will eat them. Um, so they're just this big goofy flying thing that needs a little bit of protection when it comes down to it. Um, you know, one, one of them, which I hope anyone's doing right now, is just kind of reducing your chemical usage. Um, you know, like we talked about last week, uh, chemicals last a long time on those plants. So, you know, it, it's trying to get past this, uh, this like culture that everyone has had where we have to have neatly cut grass and we have to have like every leaf on every plant that we have indoor and out so beautiful and meticulous that you know no one can actually know it's from nature you know uh, the thing I always get asked is like oh I have a pest on this plant like what do I do and the easiest thing I can tell them is take a step back you know, take 10 15 feet step back from it and look at it again can you still see that and if they say yes, I say step back further. Because nine times out of ten, what is eating that plant is not an actual pest. It may be a pest in your and I, your eyes or my eyes. You know, it goes back to those uh, those moths eating the wool pants. You know, that is considered a pest because it is doing something that we don't like. But it is just doing what nature has intended it to do. So go easy on the chemical use if you actually have true pests water does phenomenal uh, and then also you know attracting those beneficial insects to come in and eat the pest but if you go out and you see two marks on a leaf but you can't find what's doing that nine times out of ten it's going to be something that is actually beneficial for your gar your yard or garden and as soon as you spray that tree, you're actually hurting the ecosystem you're trying to create. Unless it's a monoculture, and, and in that case, it is what it is. Um, and another one is uh, keep hard landscaping to a minimum. Um, you know, keep things wild. You know, let your grass grow a little bit more. You know, you, you can still have grass. Everything doesn't have to be crazy. Uh, but don't cut it to... You know one inch or three inches you know let it let it go to five or six inches you know there's there's nothing wrong with that like who who's made that who's made that seem like a bad thing an hoa you know like i i i if i remember correctly it was like the french that started all of that like short grass like beautiful monoculture um kind of design well you know the I'm sorry, but you know, here here in the United States, we have a lot of cool pollinators, both butterflies and moths, and y'all should want to protect those. So keep your grass a little bit longer. Um, sometimes you really just want to put a walkway in there. Is that walkway going to be helpful? Not always. You know, you're putting down a mulch walkway that might introduce slugs into your garden, which could be a problem, but it could also be getting rid of an area where there might be cocoons or chrysalises hiding in the yard um, and obviously like the more the more stonework you lay like concrete and things of that nature uh, the more soil disruption you do you know the short term it's not really good long term if you can kind of counteract it with okay I'm creating a lot of soil disturbance here because I'm putting in a pond, which technically is considered a, a hardscape in a landscaping situation, but that pond is going to be a more naturalized pond where I'm going to allow uh, 
frogs and other things to uh, inhabit it, um, then, you know, there are exceptions. But uh, for the most part, those are the main um, aspects that I could give you to kind of keep with you to be like, oh, well, I'm going to be focused more on the birds are going crazy right now. Um, to where I'm gonna, where you want to focus more on creating a um, more pollinator-friendly yard for not only diurnal but uh, nocturnal species as well. Um, and that's that's pretty much it, folks. Um, do you, does anyone have any questions on uh, any things I talked about? Um, you know how to attract other types of species of moths to your yard. Um, any general plant questions at all? I do know it was a hot one today. I don't know, but I look burnt. I got dirt all over my face. Well, I'd say if uh, if no one has any other further questions, uh, I'd like to appreciate everyone for uh, tuning in tonight. For our third terror talk uh, it's much appreciated um, i enjoy doing these getting a chance to kind of sit down towards the evening the traffic isn't as bad the day it's a little cooler um i can try to get some work done while doing this also but just chatting to some people who are um, interested in the same things that i am um thanks for tuning in gotta go gotta grow